Marc has been, uh, I think, the second keynote lecturer of this uh, journée Louis André Gérard Varet more than uh, 21 years ago. So now he's coming again, and uh, we are very happy. Marc, who used to be for a while in Princeton, is now also back since 2020 to, to Paris. And uh, so I suppose that Marc Fleurbet uh, hardly uh, needs introduction to this audience. So we all uh, know uh, him or have at least heard of his work. Uh, Marc has been an incredibly uh, productive uh, researcher, also a very, I would say, consistent researcher with a very consistent uh, research agenda uh, that he has pursued since, uh, since his doctoral dissertation, which was defended a very long time ago, almost in the same time than mine. That's why I'm saying this, you know, I'm not at all, <laughs> it's not at all uh, inclination that, uh, you know, is uh, any. Uh, and, um, and this uh, research agenda is, uh, I mean, very consistent because it is based on, uh, on this, what was called at the time, this post welfareist agenda, the idea that if you want to uh, establish uh, underpinning of uh, public intervention, normative underpinning of uh, normative intervention, then you want to uh, go beyond uh, the mere uh, focus on individual well-being and you want to introduce other information than individual well-being. So Mark has worked on several, several uh, extensions of these ideas, and including, for instance, that is quite well known to many of you, this idea of taking this uh, responsibility, uh, uh, attaching importance and intrinsic importance to the responsibility that people may bear to the further choice and deriving some, um, some interesting, you know, either dilemma or social ordering, which are compatible with this. He has also developed with, uh, with Francois Maniquet, who is also a, an old friend here, uh, an important uh, research work also in which they have within the standard, I would say, Arovian framework, that is to say, uh, uh, aggregating individual ordinal preference, they have shown how we can complement this by some non-welfare information and provide social ordering, which, has, which are Pareto, Pareto based and nonetheless uh, can give consistent uh, ordering, which are called fair ordering, which they have used extensively. So, I mean, I'm not going to go on for, uh, you know, minutes and minutes about uh, the important work of Marc Florbe, and I will uh, rather uh, give him the floor, uh, noticing simply that uh, even today he's going to pursue this kind of uh, agenda because he's going to talk about, um, you know, social embeddedness. So he's going to enrich a little bit the information that is, uh, that is used to make uh, policy recommendation by taking not only economic, but as I understood, social information. And I will uh, therefore give the floor to him to explain to us this idea. OK, thank you, Nicola, for your kind introduction. It's always a, a treat to be on stage with Nicola. We've known each other forever, so yeah, indeed. Um, uh, and I, I congratulate you all uh, for the organization of this uh, wonderful conference. And it's really great to see not just the old friends, but also many uh, new and young faces in this group. So I think it's a very promising area. Um, so I'm not sure I'm consistent, but I will actually present something that is uh, a bit different from what I've been doing uh, for, for, uh, yeah, for some, some years. Thank you uh, for the slide. And so this is the joint work with uh, uh, Ravi Kambour and uh, Denis uh, Snower. And um, uh, yeah, and so uh, we'll, um, let, me, let me just uh, explain what this is, what this is about, uh, the motivation for this. So, um, I've myself embraced the economic methodology for, for many years, uh, which consists in building models or working on models which focus on economic issues, right? And so uh, you essentially uh, do as if the economy could be separated from the rest of what happens outside the economy. And uh, you focus on uh, commodities or resources, uh, and you focus on that both in terms of uh, efficiency analysis, but also in terms of equity analysis, because the kind of uh, fairness uh, theory I've been working on was also about uh, inequalities in resources and, and how to deal with that. Okay, so uh, focus on something that's really uh, a separate analysis of, uh, of the economy. Now, um, what we uh, start doing in this project is to say maybe, uh, maybe that's a problem. Because um, if the economy is just a small part or a part of what makes human life, which includes a lot of non-economic interactions, 
um, we may be uh, making a big mistake by ignoring this thing, especially if these other interactions are really entangled with the economic uh, interactions between people. And so it may happen uh, that, um, for instance, seeking efficiency in the economy can actually uh, do a bad service to the rest of the social uh, uh, system. Uh, for instance, if you have um, economic growth, which may look good, or growth in the productivity of uh, some production sectors, uh, that may uh, lead people to pay more attention to that, devote more of their energy and life to that, and less to uh, the non-economic aspects of their life. So community life could decline because people are obsessed about the economy, for instance, right? Um, and similarly, uh, when we talk about inequalities, maybe there are uh, non-economic inequalities, for instance, talking about discrimination in gender uh, terms, uh, we focus a lot on the wage gap. Maybe we should also look at differences in power uh, and other things like uh, social standing, prestige, and all that, uh, which may matter a lot to, to people. Um, I, I mentioned uh, Adam's fallacy here. This is a title of an interesting book by Duncan Foley. Um, what he calls Adam's fallacy is the uh, invisible hand, the story that from uh, selfish interest can come some social um, benefits. Um, but in fact, maybe there is another Adam's fallacy, which is the possibility to uh, study economics in isolation, ignoring what happens outside the, the economy. So that's, uh, that's what we focus on here. And so what we try to move toward is a vision of uh, human beings as uh, social animals, and in which they care about the social interactions they have outside uh, the economy. And um, you, we can still keep a lot of the concepts, like efficiency can still be defined in the same way, except that it has to encompass all the things that people care about, right? So it's a broader uh, notion of, uh, of well-being. And uh, equity should uh, include uh, these non-economic dimensions of uh, advantage or benefits or well-being that, that people may have. And the question is, uh, once we do that, what remains of what we are used to do in, uh, in, in, uh, in our main economic analysis? So in a way, not much remains. So the big concepts remain, but the conclusions uh, are, are a bit shaken. So um, let me uh, mention a bit too briefly, but uh, that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. And so um, I, I'm very eager to hear from you if there are parts of the literature that we, we don't know well enough. But... There is a big, already a big tradition uh, studying what is sometimes called social economics. And this literature has uh, studied uh, phenomena that occur when you have social influences between people in various ways, so social interactions. And here is a, a list of uh, important names in, the, in this field. And you have even subfields of economics like identity economics, uh, network economics to some extent. This is a large formal uh, setting, but is, uh, is also focused on, on this kind of uh, non-economic interaction sometimes. Uh, even something that's less formal, but what Schiller calls narrative economics is very much about interactions which are, which are not through uh, standard um, economic transactions. And so um, what we want to do is to do something that doesn't seem to have been done yet by this literature. So I hope I'm not wrong, okay? But which is to build a sort of basic canonical model that encompasses uh, these social interactions in the uh, analysis, um, and, and that really embeds uh, the economy in the larger uh, social game. And so what we do here is to try to build a sort of general equilibrium model that would describe not just one aspect of social interactions, right, but the whole situation of, uh, of human interactions uh, in one same model with the possibility to talk about inequalities in the in a, in a broad, broad sense, um, also in this, uh, in this type of model. So in this, so we have started exploring uh, a few models uh, that try to do that. So this, uh, in this version of the paper, uh, which may not be the last one, we are um, focusing on the first uh, basic model that we constructed, which is we take the uh, arrow de Bro equilibrium, so standard, the perfect uh, competitive market, very standard, very basic, and we augment it by a social game. And we look at what happens when we do that, okay? So in a way we do that for, for a reason, which is that this is the economic model, which is somehow the most favorable 
to, uh, to the economy in the sense that this is where we know very well how we can have efficient allocations and so on, right? So it's, a, of course, if we put a lot of market imperfections or a lot of market failures in uh, the economy, uh, obviously uh, the situation will be, will look bad for the economy already, right? So we start from a situation where this, from a model where the situation looks the best possible for uh, the economy and see what happens, right? That's the, that's the goal. Okay, um, is there any question or comment before I, I move on to the basics, no? Okay, so let me um, summarize the, the main uh, insight. The first uh, thing is that it looks like such a model is, is uh, not so difficult to do and is uh, remains tractable, so the first uh, lesson. Um, the second is, uh, if we look at efficiency and equity, in terms of efficiency, it's not surprising, but the fundamental welfare uh, theorems are undermined because as soon as you introduce other dimensions, you can have, as I said before, an efficient economy, but doesn't mean much because the rest can be uh, pretty uh, disturbing. Um, we, use, we are used to considering that uh, the absence of externalities is a sort of necessary condition for, uh, for achieving efficiency. I mean, I say we are used to thinking in these terms. There is no theorem that says that, and indeed, there was, it would be wrong. Uh, we don't need the absence of externalities to, to have efficiency. But with this model, we can analyze exactly what we need to get uh, to, uh, to an efficient allocation. Um, and what is um, perhaps another interesting insight is that if we want to achieve efficiency of the whole system, it's not enough to have an efficient um, economy. That's necessary, but not enough. It's not enough to have an efficient social game. That's also necessary. And to have both is also necessary, but not enough. What we need is also a good coordination between the social sphere and the economic sphere, right? So that, that makes uh, the matter a little more complex. Now, regarding equity, um, there is this issue that Nicolas was uh, alluding to, which is how do we measure uh, inequalities when we have many dimensions in life? Uh, and so we propose a measure of socioeconomic um, well-being that can be used for uh, inequality measurement. And that can uh, lend itself to decompositions between economic and social components. So we, we can really imagine doing. So this is a theory paper, but I'm hoping to have some uh, numerical uh, or empirical applications in, in some later uh, stage of this project. Um, and, um, and yeah, and another thing is, is we can, in, in this kind of model, you have both uh, what we are used to do in the uh, economic analysis of general equilibrium effects and what you find in social interactions models, which is, which is uh, social multipliers. So we can have both. And when we look at something that happens in the model, we can have both effects and dis distinguish them um, in, this, in this model. Okay, so um, unless there is a question or remark, let me uh, move on to the description of the basic model that we have in this paper. So each individual's uh, utility will depend on two things, the commodity consumption, uh, which can include the uh, selling uh, services um, like labor, so XI, and a variable that is a vector potentially that describes the social situation of the individual. I should say the social, so I will call it social standing here to make sure that uh, this is um, seen as a personal outcome, right? A little bit like personal consumption. But it could also uh, encapsulate things about the distribution in society that the individual cares about, right? So inequalities uh, in society could be put in this thing, right? So it's um, how you see the social situation, not just in terms of your own social standing, but also larger uh, things, potentially. Can, can this vector also be made of some public, uh, public dimension, which are constrained to be the same for all agents in society? Yeah, so some, exactly. So there, there could be some uh, social uh, public goods that could occur. In the economy, we won't have public goods in the traditional sense because we just keep the Yarrow de Brun model. But indeed, uh, with, with the social game, we can have public good uh, features, absolutely, yeah. Uh, you'll see an example. Um, okay, so that's uh, the basic thing about people's preferences. What about their constraints? So first we have the economic constraints, so a typical um, consumption set and uh, budget constraints. So the individual has uh, as uh, an endowment and as a budget. There will be production in this model because it's nice to have some examples where you see a shifting of uh, production from one sector to another. 
Um, but we'll assume constant returns to scale, so there is no issue of distributing profits. Profits are always zero in the, in the equilibrium. Um, and then you have a social constraint. So the social game is doing the following. So this uh, variable or this uh, vector of variables, uh, y, will be determined by uh, what happens, oh, sorry, by what happens in the, uh, no, that's okay, actually, by what happens in the economy. So that's the whole allocation. Uh, and that's the whole uh, profile of strategies uh, adopted by people in the social game. So your social standing can depend on all of them, right? So for instance, if you care about economic inequalities, uh, that could uh, appear in the uh, influence of uh, X on, uh, on FI, right? Okay, and so um, one issue that we face when we build this sort of model is um, how, so somehow we are familiar with describing economic transactions. Uh, we know how it works. Uh, people uh, transfer resources and there is a price payment and so on. Um, what about social, a social game can have any kind of structure. So the, the possibilities are infinite. So how can we make it a little more specific so that we don't run into a completely uh, unwieldy uh, story? Um, and so it looks like the examples we've been cooking uh, so far can all be put in the following uh, mold, which is that um, indiv individual strategies are just uh, vectors that describe how uh, an individual uh, directs something like a message or uh, an action or some, some quantity of uh, symbolic uh, action to everybody else in society. So it can be zero if uh, you only care about your immediate neighbors, right? So it might not be a, a positive action toward everybody, but uh, mathematically, it would be this sort of uh, vector. This is very tentative. Maybe we are missing certain things, but Mirna. No, that's your social strategy. Your social strategy is, is SI, right? That's what you do. So I'm talking to you, I'm talking to everybody in this room, but I'm not talking to the people outside the room, right? Exactly, exactly, absolutely. So that's, that's the YI. So that's the social standing. Okay, and so uh, for instance, yeah, having a, a raptured audience, uh, if that's a measure of social standing, depends on what the others do. If they listen quietly, yes. If they uh, make a lot of noise, no. Okay, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, I guess, yes. Um, in, in roles you have, uh, besides uh, income and wealth, you do have things like um, the powers and prerogatives of positions of responsibility. So that probably could be described in this way. And you have the social basis of self-respect, um, which is a sort of vague notion. We don't know exactly what it is, but could perhaps be some, something like that. How, how you are viewed uh, in society. So uh, yeah, you have a very small literature on the economic of esteem, for instance, uh, there was a book on, on this. So um, yeah, so that, that could fit in, in this, uh, this setting, I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, I think it's um, easy to think in terms of uh, uh, these actions as a support, which can be positive if it's positive, can be negative, right? So you can have negative support if you undermine the others uh, and, and your, uh, social standing depends on all the support, positive or negative, that you receive from others. But it can depend on, on that uh, with different technologies. And here are, so maybe I should uh, not spend too much time on that, but here are some examples of uh, technologies. Um, so you have the, the first one, this is uh, the one in which your standing uh, depends on the minimum. So um, uh, I'm sorry, I missed a few things. So there is a D here that I should have removed. I tried to simplify compared to the paper, but I forgot to remove something. But um, so your, your standing could depend on the, the, the smallest value of the things that you receive from the others. For instance, uh, it could be that your reputation uh, is undermined by the person who has the lowest opinion about you, for instance, right? It's enough to have one person who uh, says something bad about you to discredit you uh, with respect to the rest of society. So that could be something like that. The opposite would be the case in which it's enough to have 
one person who gives you maximum support so that you get accepted in the, to a certain level. Um, or you could have something in between, which is uh, an additive thing. So if you want to be elected president of the Republic, you need 50% uh, of the vote. So that, that would be more uh, an, an additive function. But uh, the, these Y are multidimensional, no? So I mean, so then how you define the min or the max? I mean, because if you have uh, the min over a vector, it's hard to, so I yeah. guess you have a mean, so, so you- Yeah, exactly. So that's why I removed. So here it was for, for particular dimensions and I removed okay. rather that from the slide to simplify. Sure. Okay. But yeah, yeah. So it depends. So in, my, in some of my examples, uh, the Ys will be sometimes just one dimensional sometimes uh, two-dimensional, but not more than that. But yeah, for each dimension, you can have okay, a you particular technology. Special. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so you, you can have things where uh, what you, um, so this affordability story here is when um, you uh, can obtain standing by a combination of resources and social action. So if you want to invite uh, uh, friends for drinks, uh, well, you better be able to pay for some of the drinks, right? So. So that's the kind of situation where uh, there is some complementarity between the, the economic and the social side. Maybe not in Marseille, I don't know, but anyway. Uh, now, uh, in, another thing is perhaps you can use economic uh, pressure on people to make them behave well. So you can punish people if they don't behave well according to certain social uh, norms uh, and, and uh, bar access to some transactions or some market. Um, so you have a lot of possibilities and then you can have a, a contest so people may compete uh, to to have the largest house in the neighborhood or the, the biggest car or whatever um okay now an equilibrium in this setting will be the combination of a varas equilibrium for the economy and a nash equilibrium for this the, the social game um, and so an individual uh, i will maximize the utility subject to the economic and social constraint Okay, so this is just a summary of the thing. Choosing what? Choosing the consumption and choosing the personal strategy. Okay, so as I said, there is production, but one productive sector which uh, maximizes, so there will be a cone and maximizes profit. And the clearing of the market is the usual uh, thing with a, with a productive vector that can change the total endowment. Now, there is no equivalent of market clearing for the social game, but you have the, the FI functions that describe what, what's possible. Um, and so that's that's the definition of the uh, of the equilibrium. Okay, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So so it can depend on what happens in the economic uh, right so the social game is is not independent of the of the economic game in in the general formulation so you can make special assumptions as i'll say to to cut off this link but uh, that's one possible link absolutely yeah yeah um okay so we have an existence theorem just to show that this is not a pie in the sky right so but not particularly interesting um mm -hmm. And um, we try to disentangle a little bit the two connections that we have between the two spheres of the model, because there is one connection through individual preferences. People may care about what happens in the economy and in uh, society, right? Um, and there is the connection in the game that we just uh, talked about. And so you can separate these things. So you could imagine that the individual preferences are actually completely separable so that economic preferences don't depend on social standing and conversely, um, or you could assume uh, that the social game uh, is not influenced by what happens in the economy. So here we have um, uh, some uh, American culture kind of uh, references here to think of, of this term. So the park model is the model in which um, people uh, have social interactions in the park where everybody is, uh, is uh, dressed the same as a jogging outfit or something like that. So you don't know if people are rich or not. Uh, and, um, and, and what you do in the park is not influenced by, by your wealth. And conversely, what you do in the economy is not influenced by what you do in the park, right? So complete, uh, complete separation. Uh, whereas the, the backyard uh, thing is uh, where you, if you invite people in your backyard, then that's when you have to be able to have some drinks and the barbecue, whatever. So that, that requires some economic resources. Um, the community thing is when you can have interactions, so you may be influenced in terms of uh, your tests for commodities may depend on the social game, 
um, but you don't have uh, you don't have a game that uh, itself is uh, uh, so the technology of the game is not is not influenced. Okay, so what I've been doing uh, and many of us do usually when we do conventional economics is essentially to uh, assume something very special in this model, which is that the utilities of the people depend only on the economic side. Uh, so somehow the rest is fixed or uh, or that the uh, social standing, maybe it's not fixed, maybe we care about it, but it is not really a game. It only depends on your own personal situation. So no externalities in this, uh, in this game, okay? Um, so that's a way in which we can, so very, so what we've been doing uh, somehow in, in the standard economic approaches is, is, is a very, very specific version of this, uh, of this model. Okay, now let me uh, try to uh, say a few things about efficiency and equity. So I'll try to be a little quick. Um, so efficiency can be defined as usual in terms of not wasting opportunities for well-being. Okay, so a socioeconomic allocation X, Y uh, is efficient if there is no other uh, such allocation that makes everyone better off. We can also define the um, efficiency of the economic allocation taking the social stand, the distribution of social standing as given, right? So imagining changing only what happens in X, and we can talk about efficiency of the social situation. So why, when we fix X and we only consider changing Y? Okay, so that's um, uh, that's a way of uh, separating efficiency of the two components. Um, so. We, we start doing a little bit of first order analysis of efficiency conditions. And um, so I'll, I'll skip that because it would take too much time to describe in detail. But so we have one condition for the consumption, one condition for the social strategies and uh, one for, for the technology. Um, but yep, sorry, where is the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, no, so you assume that you can really move one without moving the other. So somehow, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that may require a changing S in some way at some point, but yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, no good question. Um, okay, so uh, here I have a few results. So the first thing uh, that I already alluded to is that an allocation can be, so socioeconomic allocation is efficient only if X and Y are each separately efficient, as we just defined that. But this is not sufficient in general, and I will explain that uh, later on. Uh, now, you can, of course, achieve efficiency in absence of externalities, right? So when the, what happens to people's welfare doesn't depend on what the others are, are doing. Um, so that's the usual way in which we think of, uh, of achieving efficiency uh, by just uh, removing uh, externalities. But in fact, we can also have situations where we have, for instance, absence of externalities in the economy and in the social game, people have common utility, common social goals, so that my best social strategy is not just maximizing my own utility, but also maximizing everybody else's utility, right? So common goals is a way of, um, of having uh, externalities, but without having uh, problematic externalities for efficiency. And finally, even if you don't have common goals, you can have uh, efficiency when the externalities are what we could call balance. So the, the total uh, willingness to pay for the uh, actions generating externality, whether it's X or it's uh, S, uh, the total willingness to pay is zero. Or in fact, it need not be zero for everything. For commodities, it can be marginal than that. It can be just uh, proportional to prices. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that enables you to get uh, an efficient allocation. Yes, Eugenie. Yeah, so a very standard game. Uh, so people uh, somehow don't make mistakes about the strategies of the others. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a very simple model in a sense, right? There is no fancy uh, issue of uh, strategy or things like that. Uh, very, very basic Nash equilibrium. D does that answer the question? Or, yeah, yeah, so it's full information. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so that's a um, way to get uh, efficiency. And um, 
I wanted to illustrate maybe uh, what I'll do is just, uh, and I apologize, I'm pretty sure that some of you have already seen this example because uh, I've presented this example many times already. Um, take the case uh, of the park model, which is the one where the separation between the economy and society is, uh, is the, the starkest. And so somehow efficiency is the easiest to achieve there. Um, and the economic side is completely trivial. There is one unproduced commodity and people just consume what they have. Okay, so no transaction. It could not be more trivial than that. Um, and the social side has the veto technology. So you have something like a time spent chatting. That's the social outcome that people care about. And so in a way, it's a kind of public good because uh, people have to be together to, to chat. Um, and, um, and what happens is it's a veto technology in the sense that the first who leaves the conversation is stopping the conversation, right? Um, and, and we'll do that with two agents, so there is no ambiguity about the fact that this is what will happen. Um, so this is a, a typical example of what could happen. So you have a rich guy, uh, individual one, a less rich guy, individual two. Uh, they chat a certain uh, time, and what happens is they stop uh, chatting at this, um, at this level. So Y is the uh, horizontal axis, if you don't see very well, and X is the vertical axis. Um, and so they stop here because this is the optimal chatting time for individual one. He wants to, he has enough, and so he gets out. Uh, and individual two is frustrated, would like to chat longer, but uh, the game is, is like that. And so this is uh, the uh, efficient social uh, equilibrium here, uh, but this is the, the social economic equilibrium is not efficient, right? So the economy is efficient trivially, the social game is efficient because you cannot change the social strategies of these individuals to make things better for everybody for a simple reason. Individual one has the best that he could have, right? Uh, so whatever you change will be bad for individual one. Um, but this is inefficient. And a way to make everybody better off is to coordinate the economy and the social game by allowing a transfer of resources from the frustrated individual two to uh, the uh, individual one, right? So in this case, everybody is better off, uh, they, um, they chat longer, um, and, and that's okay. Now you could say that looks very much like a transaction, right? It's as if individual two was paying individual one to stay a little longer, right? So would you be willing to chat a little longer if I give you 10 euros? Uh, so this kind of conversation we never have. Why that, right? That's interesting in itself. And so presumably, um, uh, if we introduce additional markets, uh, that could be a solution in some cases, but not in all cases, because some uh, social interactions are not commodified for a reason. Right? Um, and so, so, that's, uh, so why is that the case? Well, I think we can build a theory about that, but I don't have a full theory, but I don't have the time to, to develop that. But even if we don't introduce a market, we can do something by changing the norms. Uh, so social norms of politeness can help a little bit. And so the social norm of politeness is when individual one, he had enough conversation, but he says, oh, I see that the guy wants to chat more. I will stay a little longer out of politeness, okay? And so if, if they do that, then you can have, so this is an efficient allocation again, because the slope of these two uh, individual indifference curves are the same um, in absolute value. And, and that's an efficient allocation. So individual one is polite, it stays a little longer. And individual two is better off uh, benefits from, from uh, individual one's politeness, okay? So that's the kind of analysis we can do. And you see, it's very simple to see here that uh, even though we have efficiency in the two spheres, that can, be, uh, that can go together with a lot of inefficiency in the whole system. We need coordination between the two spheres. Okay, um, now, um, if we introduce now interactions between the economy and society, uh, then uh, we run into additional reasons for, um, for inefficiency. So there is another example that I won't present, but which, in which um, if you have a, a sort of social norm that you should reciprocate invitations, uh, the interactions may be limited by inequalities in resources because the poorest guy cannot uh, reciprocate inviting the rich neighbor. Uh, and so uh, this limits their social interactions. Uh, if you redistribute resources between them, uh, so I won't explain more, but if you, if you uh, redistribute resources, you can uh, make everybody better off because the poor guy now can invite the rich guy more. The rich guy is, is less rich, but enjoys uh, having more visits to the neighbor now. Uh, so again, an issue of uh, uh, coordination between the two spheres. But here, uh, public policy that uh, redistribute resources can have an impact directly on the, on the social game. 
Um, there is another example, uh, which is in the community model, which is the situation in which you have uh, interactions between the um, social uh, actions and, uh, and, and the co commodity. So think of uh, support, for instance. You can, you can help uh, your family members, for instance, or you can use a, a private institution to take care of them or private service, right? Or you can uh, spend time chatting uh, in the square of the village, or you can watch TV at home or uh, watch a Netflix at home, uh, paying a subscription for that, right? And so there can be um, a lot of uh, substitutability between the social uh, strategies and a commodity that you can buy on the market. And when you have that, uh, your preference for the uh, marketed good depends very much on the social strategies of the people. If your neighbors are in the square, uh, the television is less attractive and, and conversely. Right? And so what can happen in this kind of game is that uh, you can have inefficiencies in any direction. So it may be that you have uh, too much uh, marketed good and social interactions are uh, too limited because of that, or the opposite, you can have excessive uh, social norms, uh, social uh, interaction, because there is pressure, right? You would like to watch TV at home, but your neighbors will complain if you don't go and, and chat with them. Or if you are the, uh, uh, the daughter of the family, you have to take care of your parents when they get old. And this sort, so this sort of social norm can be very problematic and and the market can liberate people so it can go really both ways um, but we we provide an example where um, you can have uh, inefficient uh, allocations in this sense but if you have uh, an improvement in the economy for instance the commodity uh, the the commodified uh, service it, it becomes cheaper so there is a gain in productivity uh, that will attract people to uh, rely on it and it can kill uh, completely the, uh, the uh, situation that were, was, was close to the optimum and people may just uh, stay at home and watch TV and never go back to uh, chatting with the neighbors uh, after them. Okay, so, so a lot of possibilities. So I'm not defending a particular theory of what happens in the world. Uh, the purpose of this project is to uh, give a tool that is very convenient to describe many phenomena of this sort, right? So in the same model, you have a lot of possibilities to uh, describe uh, all of that. So given the time constraint, I will, uh, I will uh, say a few words about equity. And maybe the thing I should um, mention is um, the, so yeah, so there are the compositions in terms of general equilibrium and, and social multiplier and so on, which are convenient. Uh, the one thing maybe I should uh, just focus on and, and stop there is this issue of how to measure inequality and how to think uh, about equity. So, um, here is one uh, notion of equity that seems pretty intuitive, which is uh, if we don't have inequalities in social standing, then it makes sense to, to uh, search for, to, uh, to push for um, reducing inequalities in, uh, in resources, right? So what we've been doing in, in, in a lot of our work in, um, in the theory of fairness or fair allocation, for instance. Um, and so that's this notion of economic equity, okay? Social improvement. If you reduce economic inequalities when there is no issue about uh, social uh, inequalities. Unfortunately, uh, when uh, people have heterogeneous preferences, uh, this will not uh, be compatible with Pareto, and uh, this will not surprise some people in the room, uh, like Alain, for instance. Uh, and, um, and this is because when people have heterogeneous preferences, uh, you may have uh, a configuration like that, where um, at some level of, uh, of social outcome, inequality is in one direction. At another level, on a Pareto in different allocation, the inequality is in the other direction. So you don't know really who you should uh, tax and who you should help in this situation. And so what should we do if we cannot, if we can no longer, so somehow this is an argument against focusing on economic equity, because we really should take care of the whole picture. Um, but we can, and the, the, what we propose in the paper is to uh, use a, a sort of money metric utility, which computes, so which takes the, the economic resources, but corrects them for the gap between the uh, social standing and the ideal social standing that the person would like to have. And so this is what we call equivalent income here, but I mean, this sort of a, a equivalent notion like that. So you have an indifference curve like that. So this is the, the situation of the individual in economic terms, but he would have enough if he had this level and could get to the optimal, uh, to the ideal level of uh, 
of, uh, of social, uh, out, social standing or social outcome. Okay, and so if you do that, then you can uh, describe uh, things. So we, yeah, we provide a very easy characterization of that. And then you can, uh, for in the example that I had before, we can describe inequalities. So inequalities in economic terms were just uh, like that, but inequalities in socioeconomic terms. So for individual one, the equivalent income is the same as what he has, so the same as the ordinary income. Uh, but for the other individual, there is this gap. So the inequality is actually larger so the frustration of the poor guy adds to the inequalities. If the rich guy was the frustrated one, that would reduce inequalities compared to economic inequalities. Okay, so that gives a um, um, better picture of the situation. And maybe I should uh, conclude with this uh, general. Okay, Nicolas, to leave yes, time yes, for yes, discussion. Sure, sure. Yeah. No, but you can. Uh, yeah, you can have still uh, five minutes if you want. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if we look at the labor market. Uh, there is uh, something interesting in uh, Adam Smith's uh, theory of the moral uh, sentiments. There is another invisible hand uh, than the one we everybody knows, which is the idea that the labor market transfers resources from the rich employers to the poor employees, and that reduces inequality in consumption compared to inequality in wealth. Right. So there is a sort of invisible hand that leads to equality of consumption. Um, and, and so that's um, a very positive view about the, the labor market. Um, now the modern view is, uh, is still saying that, of course, a trade is always beneficial to all parties, but we can still have substantial uh, inequalities between uh, the various uh, people. What is still missing and what we can describe in our model here is that certain uh, labor contracts are really like Faustian bargains where you sell not just your time, but you sell also your dignity because you'll enter a relation where you become the servant of your employer or the, uh, okay, something like that. Um, and and this, uh, uh, this trade of dignity for subsistence may be uh, something that is problematic. And we can measure that with the equivalent income because we'll see that the benefit from uh, getting some economic resources is uh, partly uh, uh, diminished by the fact that you lose something on the social standing. Okay. Um, and um, um, another thing that you can do is yeah, disentangling the contribution. So th this is something that is easy to write, but uh, takes time to, uh, to explain. And I, I'm hoping that in some later paper, we'll do a, an empirical application of the decomposition. And my conjecture is that if we have reasonable estimates of the importance for people of their economic standing and their social standing, uh, the inequalities will turn out to be um, largely due, I don't know the proportion, but largely due to the uh, social part. The economic part will not be uh, the, the only one. Uh, and so, so I think that's uh, quite interesting to try to explore. Okay, so I, I'll stop here essentially with some questions. Um, what we don't do in this paper, and that would require some empirical basis as well, is to analyze whether the interaction between the two spheres is mostly positive or negative. So to give you an idea, and that requires um, also a different model that would include market failures on the economic side. So when we have market failures in the economy, the social game can help because people can adopt some responsible uh, norms of behavior that can take care, for instance, of insufficient production of public goods and this sort of thing. Um, and so corporate social responsibility can be analyzed in, the, in these terms, right? Provide some public goods that are not, uh, that are not really well provided otherwise. Um, and you can have also solidarity, right? People may care about one another and, uh, and, and distribute resources uh, freely without going through the, the central redistributive mechanism. Um, but you can also have negative interactions. You can have uh, status competition where people throw a lot of energy and time in, uh, in the competition. And that may be very wasteful, both for the economy, for the environment, or whatever. Um, and you can have uh, things where uh, nasty social ideas like discrimination, prejudices, uh, can uh, play a role in the economy. And we've, we had a nice uh, talk yesterday about this topic. But this is really something that we can also put in this, uh, this type of model. Uh, and one thing that we don't do at all in this paper is uh, public policy. So there is no state in the model. Um, and it would be interesting to analyze the division of labor that would be uh, desirable between public intervention and private initiative. Uh, so social norms or norms of responsibility, how can they um, help? 
but how can they uh, um, interact with uh, with public information uh, with public intervention and, and centralized uh, centralized policy uh, okay so sorry i've been a bit quick and uh, and uh, short at some points but i hope you you've had the the main uh, substance of, of this project thanks a lot thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark, for this very uh, nice and clear presentation. And so we have also the perfect respect of time. So we have now some time for questions or comments. So uh, Alain, you wanna you wanna start? <laughs> it's just a remark about uh, chat in parks. I participate uh, in the 80s in a, in a conference in Cuba, and people were very poor at that time, and uh, academics too. And uh, I remind that uh, some academics uh, who engage in conversation, in, a, in chat review, in talking review, uh, they, uh, some of them ask uh, money uh, because they, are, they were so poor and they, they, they suspected that there was a, a big difference between uh, our incomes or the incomes of people coming from the West and, and Cuba. So it's just an example uh, saying that here we can say that the, there was may, maybe a missing market and here the market was uh, trying to, to develop in, in that direction. So here my, my question is, is about what, what about this question of uh, missing market in, in your framework? Uh, second question is about uh, gifts. Can you incorporate, can you uh, uh, incorporate gifts in, in your model? Uh, and uh, another idea, building upon the, the remark by, uh, by Nicola about public goods, uh, don't you think that, for example, when you put your picture on Instagram, and you get a like, it is, this like is a, like a Lindol price. And in fact, it is a, the, photo, the, the picture is like a local public good. And so uh, here maybe there will be an extension for your, uh, mm -hmm. for your framework. But yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, Anna. So the, the missing markets indeed. And I think what with the, um, so uh, in the way, in the, way the, the example I gave is, is um, is hinting at this uh, at this uh, story. What we would like to do in this project is uh, to go toward a theory of optimal commodification. In a way, that would be because, uh, but that depends on having uh, a theory about what makes commodification acceptable or not for certain uh, interactions, right? And that has a lot to do with, um, I guess, uh, with whether certain things are can be incentivized or not. Right. So it's very hard to incentivize people to believe something, for instance, but people care about the beliefs of others. Uh, but that would require a, a more complex description of the game that what, than what we have here. Um, and so, so there are limits to uh, what can be commodified, and, um, and we have to, uh, to put that into the, the story. So in some cases, uh, a market can be a solution. Uh, in some other cases, uh, it would actually kill the, the quality of the, of the social interaction. Uh, but we need we need a specific theory for that, and I, I don't think it exists a sort of theory of optimal commodification. Uh, so gift, yes, absolutely, we don't have gifts in the in this model, and that's another thing that uh, could be introduced. Uh, what we have um, uh, an old version of the working paper where we have um, uh, theft uh, and or in charity, uh, so begging actually begging activity and uh, with some potentially with some violence and. Um, uh, so, so that is uh, a little bit going in that direction, but yeah. So you can you can play a lot with this type of model can uh, can describe a lot of things, and uh, about likes in Instagram, um, yeah. So this is typically the the, the, the good example of uh, uh, support, right? So the strategy people liking certain things that the others do. This is very much like the SIJ in our little model, and you're standing in on social networks. Um, depends very much on how many uh, followers you have or this sort of thing. So it's very much this, uh, uh, this, uh, this thing. So somehow these, these games are, uh, are this, the purest version of this sort of interaction. 
but there is there is here maybe a, a local public good dimension. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, absolutely. So the technology is um, uh, the technology is uh, absolutely compatible with uh, public good effects because. Uh, what one person does can influence uh, a few targeted people or or be actually a diffuse have a diffuse impact on many people okay uh, another question yes miana it also seems consistent with club models right because you could with what with models of clubs yeah. because you could direct resources to a limited number of people yes yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Actually, we, we, we initially called the community model, we call, we, uh, we call that the club model, but uh, it was, it was too, too specific as a notion, but yeah, because clubs actually sometimes have some economic price to get into and this sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, yeah, there is a question. I mean, so Michel, and then there is, uh, oh, okay. And then yeah. after that, Michel, you will. Uh... Okay, so I have a question about measurement. Uh, so, in particular, for the efficiency part, if you wanted to measure the efficiency loss, ah. um, and my question would be more: Could you use actually? Could you devise new ways of using the the market sphere to evaluate uh, efficiency losses on the social sphere, where they may be very difficult to compute? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you can actually the the equivalent income measure. Right, could be used uh, quite directly, I think. Uh, but I don't know whether, um, yeah, I have to think more about it, right? Something like the De Broeck coefficient of, uh, uh, yeah, could be used in, the, in this setting. Um, but certainly, uh, yeah, we can, I mean, somehow we are using the economic part of, uh, of the model to measure socioeconomic worth. So somehow it's very convenient to use that as a measuring rod, right? Uh, so I, I guess the answer is yes, but uh, I don't have the details of how uh, how we could do it. Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, the um, my question is about uh, is there a relation, or could you establish a relation between your, your model and the uh, the notion of social capital by uh, Nam? Uh, because in social capital, people have relations, have norms, have values that they share. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great question again. Uh, yeah, so it's it's absolutely uh, in line with this uh, with 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 this kind of uh, notion. Um, and so here, uh, one thing that is missing though is um, uh, usually social capital is analyzed in a in a dynamic setting where you you have something that can help you uh, do things in the future, uh, like education. Uh, it's an investment, and so on. So you have a or investing in uh, reputation or investing in uh, ties to other people so here we don't really have that so everything is static in this basic model uh, so that misses a little bit some uh, interesting features that we could have and especially there is no transmission for instance across generations uh, right so this is again a very basic one uh, the goal somehow is to to see if a, such a basic thing we how much can we tell what, what are the the stories that we can tell with such a basic model. That's the, somehow the project, right? Before going into, so for instance, you have interesting uh, papers by uh, George Melath and uh, Andy Postlewaite and so on with, with, with a lot of uh, dynamic uh, uh, phenomena. So here we don't have anything like that, but that would certainly be an interesting direction. Uh, so you had a question, I think. Uh, yes. Yeah, I find this all very thought provoking. I was wondering whether in, when you think one step forward, when you think about um, gain, uh, say coordination in the social sphere, whether there isn't also a, a further dimension. So when it comes about market economies and capitalism, we have this idea of Marx Weber saying that some predispositions may have been favorable towards the establishment of markets. Now, in the social fear, something else could be happening. You could have, say, a Chinese economy that has no rejection, or at least where the government is strong enough to impose, impose a market system for social actions that uh, is captured by your S and, and Y values and uh, markets uh, on, on the uh, X values. 
uh, while other economies, uh, maybe in, in, in Western Europe and America, may find it harder. So what's your view? Do you have any comment on this uh, Chinese approach? Um, no, I'm not sure. We, we should talk about that because I, I don't know how best to represent. So somehow the, the, the uh, general equilibrium model is a model where you have a lot of uh, central action going on with the price that is seen by everybody, right? So there is a central mechanism there. We don't have anything like that in the Nash equilibrium, um, but we could imagine that uh, some central authority could coordinate, could direct people to the right equilibrium or so, some, something like that. Um, and that we, we don't describe at all. So maybe we should think in terms of a better description of, uh, of, of central interventions and the, the, the way in which such, such intervention can be impactful on the social gain. But yeah, I don't have much more to say on that. That's uh, really uh, something we should think about more. And there was some question in the back over there that I uh, cannot uh, identify the person who is reading. The... So, uh, my question is that you made assumptions about the exchange part of the economy being voluration and the other part of the economy where uh, players would be strategic. But if so, then there may be tension between the two sets of assumptions because, for instance, if you take the, the strategic part to if the rank thing is just my own rank in utility terms or in consumption terms in society, I may wish, I may be led to prefer strategic exchange mm -hmm. to valuation exchange, which might lower my utility, but if I expect other people's utility to be lowered even more than my, my, my own, and thereby to increase my relative rank, it may still be a better thing to do. So then there may be some tension between the two, the, the behavioral assumptions of the players in the two spheres of your model. Yeah, right. Uh, I'm not sure it's a tension, but it's certainly a possibility that people can have strategies but people here are assumed not to imagine that they can uh, influence the price uh, through their actions, right? So it depends on the size of the, so somehow the economy is supposed to be large enough that you can't really influence the price directly, but you can influence the social game, including by your economic actions, right? So if I buy a car that's more beautiful than yours, maybe that will uh, play a role in the social game. This is the kind of thing that people can, can think about, but not so much uh, indeed. Uh, we assume here that they are price taker. But again, maybe one thing I should have said is that we, we propose this uh, methodology uh, maybe just as a uh, general thing that we can do, right? We can, any economic model, uh, even with imperfect competition, whatever, right, uh, can be augmented by a social gain, and then you can see what happens. Uh, so that, that would be the, the idea. So I think now that we will have to stop because, I mean, the, the next session is supposed to start in three, two minutes. So thank you very much, Mark, again. And, uh...